Hey, welcome to uh, Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. I am Jim Grant, and uh, with me today is, is his customary, Eric Whitehead at the Dials, and uh, Phil Grant, the editor of Almost Daily Grants, your indispensable daily guide to goings-on in finance. And directly opposite on this shiny, very high-priced table is uh, the great Evan Lorenz, deputy editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. We are brought to you today by Grant's Interest Rate Observer. I forgot to mention that. An accountable omission. Evan, um, what is less tasteful on Wall Street than an end zone dance? Can you name one thing? Ah, Mark Zuckerberg, I think. No, Evan, the uh, correct answer to that rhetorical <laughs> question is no. And as a rule, we at Grants do not do that because, uh, first of all, it's unseemly. Second of all, it's unlucky. And third of all, opportunities for end zone dancing are um, not exactly commonplace. Anyway. But we are going to talk to, a little bit today about Facebook. Facebook was the topic of an analysis in Grants August 11th, 2017. Unassuming and uh, not wholly informative headline concerning Mark Zuckerberg, there followed a very, very... If I do say so, a very, very nuanced and, uh, to be sure, bearish analysis of Facebook at the time, a very, very unpopular, not to mention unremunerative line of thought. We'll get around to uh, Facebook in a moment, won't we, uh, Evan? Yes, we will. We had asked uh, the uh, really terrific analyst uh, from Pivotal Research Group. Uh, Brian Weiser. Brian Weiser, yeah. Brian, who would come on, who, who talked to you, and he was uh, very helpful indeed to your work. And he was, w was he not the one and only uh, bear? On I believe there were two people who were bearish on, on Facebook last August, and he was one of only two. There were 47 analysts covering the stock at the time. So yeah, that, that is still the case. There's uh, two sell ratings, one of which is Brian's, and then I believe two holds and 40-something buys. Well, anyway, we're going to precede uh, our update on Facebook with uh, a look back at uh, a piece that ran in Grant's uh, actually 22 years ago. And the headline was uh, definitive. No more of this, not just this concerning stuff. It was sell Coke. That was a headline. And um, I bring up Coke and I will linger on Coke for a few minutes by way of illustration of both the merit and uh, the lack thereof of uh, setting out an early, contrary, well-founded, and ultimately correct position. Yeah, all those things. So uh, we began the story by observing that uh, if there is one essential late century bull market American enterprise, Coke is it. It's a great stock and a great stock market, and it is trading at a great price. Furthermore, it is owned by Warren Buffett, a great investor. That was the lead. And we went on. Recently, Roberto C. Guizetta, Coke's chairman and chief executive, referred to, quote, our virtually infinite opportunity for growth. He himself provided the italics just as the company frequently deploys an infinity symbol as an unregistered trademark of our growth potential. Hmm. And here is Coke management rhetorically posing this question in the 1995 annual report. Is there ever a time you wouldn't consider buying your own stock? Uh, it asked of itself, as in repurchasing shares. Yes, it answered directly. Yes, whenever securities laws say we can't. Otherwise, we've yet to encounter a time when we felt our stock wasn't a long-term investment bargain for us. Close quote. What's that about? In other words, valuation means nothing. Yeah, means nothing. Uh, so uh, this was at a time when uh, the stock was at 39 times earnings. It commanded uh, twice the valuation of Anheuser-Busch, which uh, make her another all-American non caffeinated, a world-famous beverage. So to listen to Guizet at the time, the stockholders, they faced no meaningful risk from any contingent event because all relevant outcomes were under the control of the board of directors. It makes me think of the Federal Reserve. They're in charge. So by implication, we said, the equity of any great company should never be sold because its value accepted absurd bull market extremes, and this is not close to being one in the polls' opinion, because that stock is beyond earthly measurement. Between the chairman's optimistic lines, a reader may apprehend that the ups and downs of previous financial cycles have been superseded by a single cycle which is up. I mean, this was insufferable. And this was uh, the talking about... Uh, sticking your tongue out at the gods. Coke was doing it. So I, I, I think not, not to break a confidence, but I called up Seth Klarman. I called up Seth and I said, uh, Seth, you yourself are a pretty accomplished investor. He was 22 years away from being Seth Klarman today, but still he was Seth Klarman. I said to him, is there anything that could interrupt the ascent of the greatest company in the greatest market owned by the greatest investor in the world? Anything. And Seth paused and he said, uh, I don't know, it's, this stuff's really not good for you. <laughs> Right. So I, I, I reread this story. In fact, we're going to post this story. Uh, I reread it again with, um, with a certain amount of pride. Yeah, I, I did. But also with a certain amount, as is meat and right, of humility, because after we wrote this thing, and it was a pretty good call over the long term. In fact, this thing doubled and then uh, peaked in 1998. So it was, what, uh, 21 months early. 
fine for us. That's kind of middling. Yeah. Uh, but it peaked in 1998 and didn't get back there until 2014. So that wasn't so bad. Uh, but uh, this fellow Buffett, he, uh, Buffett just, he said the following. This is now paraphrasing Buffett uh, through the words of Eric Miller, who was the head of DLJ's uh, strategy operations. Uh, this is uh, Buffett speaking through the words of Eric Miller. Quote, he said that he would not mind if Coke and Gillette were delisted because he is not trying to predict their market prices, but rather just enjoys owning such wonderful businesses. So many observers were aghast when Coke announced last spring that it was repurchasing its shares, but Buffett said he thought such repurchases were a good idea unless the price was above the share's intrinsic value. Of course, uh, there's no telling exactly what that intrinsic value might be. So I'm going to wind up this discussion, this soliloquy actually is the truth of it. Uh, so we, we enumerated, did grants, we enumerated all the bullish features of this thing. We only had like 3,000 words to work with. You could hardly get them all in. And for the bearish side of the argument, we quoted a seemingly extraneous piece of text. You be the judge, listeners, whether it is or not, or was or not. It's a paragraph written by elegiac writer Paul Fussell. In De uh, he's the memoirist of World War II and the historian of war, a, a poet writing in prose. He described, uh, did uh, Paul Fussell, a, a series of botched night patrols in which he participated in France as a junior army officer during the Second World War. And uh, so this is, so we set this up apropos of uh, what can go wrong in human affairs. Quote, this is the memoirist recalling a night patrol, a series of night patrols, in France. All of them botched, of course. This is from Doing Battle. Uh, I was learning from these mortal farcical events, the former lieutenant relates, about the eternal presence in human affairs of accident and contingency, as well as the fatuity of optimism at any time or place. All planning was not just likely to recoil ironically, it was almost certain to do so. Human beings were clearly not like machines. They were mysterious conjuries of twisted will and error, misapprehension and misrepresentation, and the expected could not be expected of them." Close quote. In other words, we said Marcus, priced for the best possible outcome, are eventually mispriced. So, Evan Lorenz, Deputy Editor of Grants, tell us about Facebook. Well, it's not that good for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you mean? Well, uh, we, we borrowed a little bit from the work of Professor of Psychology Jean Twenge, who teaches at the San Diego State University. She actually wrote a pretty long piece in The Atlantic talking, uh, titled, Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation? And um, she wrote, more comfortable online than out partying. Post-millennials are safer physically than adolescents have ever been, but they're on the brink of a mental health crisis. And she went through different things like hurdles in life stages, like when did you first start driving a car, get a driver's license, start dating? When did you leave your parents' home? And every single well, they, measure, they haven't. They haven't. I mean, basically it's, um, you know, it's stunted the development well, this, of... When did this come out? When was this piece dated? Um, it came out a little bit before we wrote our piece. Yeah. Um, but th th those arguments um, yeah. are familiar, of course. And, and my parents said them to us. I'm now 71 and a half. They said it concerning black and white television. Uh, so the author you quote, what's her name again? Is uh, Twenge? Twenge. Yeah. Um, she acknowledges the seeming repetition of the errors of the prior generation of technophobes, but she comes and she insists that these facts are the facts in the Facebook, just as you say, paraphrase our friend Seth Klarman, is like not good for you. Yeah. But what, what else? What is, so to bring us up to, what, what did we say? Refresh the memory of those who did, perhaps did not read it. What did we say then? And what do we say now? So at the time, uh, Facebook and Google commanded 60% of all online ads and 20% of all ads in general. Right. And by 2020, it was predicted that Facebook and Google together would control half of the entire ad market and that all the rest of the advertising would go to radio, TV, what have you, but they would have half of it. And we looked at that and we said, at the time, Facebook is trading at like 15 times, you know, that 2020 earnings when it commands a quarter of the market. And at a certain point, we said, it's not going to be gaining shares, not going to be growing faster than the market. And it's going to be, you know, in a cyclical market, which is advertising and its revenue will go up and down depending on the turns of the cycle. And if you look at other mature advertising, advertising businesses like Omnicom or WPP, 15 times it's about kind of where they trade. So it looked like Facebook was fully discounting, you know, this massive share grab in advertising and not discounting any kind of problems that could come along the way. And there there are numerous and myriad problems that we laid out here, one of them being let that me, it's not good for let you. Let me pause here and just draw one uh, parallel with our Coca-Cola story of uh, more than two decades ago. People may re or may not remember, but uh, this very aggressive CEO, uh, Roberto Guizetta, said that, uh, he said that, you know, humans uh, uh, intake uh, uh, 60 
54 fluid ounces of liquid a day. He said, but consider Coca-Cola accounts for less than two of those ounces. We have 62 ounces a day to work with. That's the upside. And we have uh, 24 hours a day uh, to, to sit on our uh, smartphones and flip through Facebook. But uh, Phil actually has some stats on what's actually happening with the time that we're spending on Facebook. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in March 8th, follow up from, uh, from Brian uh, Weiser noted uh, some Nielsen data, which was, was quite striking, namely a 18% uh, decline in aggregated time spent on Facebook, despite an 8% increase in users. Uh, so that over what period? Um, that that is uh, that's month on month. Uh, December 17 from December 16. Oh right, that's right. The, the full year on year decline is 4% for core Facebook and 2% if you even include the uh, the Facebook Messenger. If you go to an average uh, time spent per user, that's a 5% decline over over both metrics. So so people are using it less. Uh, they're engaging less with it. I mean, in as much as we have 24 hours a day, people are allocating that time elsewhere. Drinking Coke, I suppose. Drinking Coke, I suppose. Or maybe going outside and playing. Is that allowed? Um, uh, so, we're, so we're, where do we stand now on Facebook? So it has, it, it's hit a, what the bulls might say is a bump on the road. This is one of the greatest advertising gathering machines ever devised, right? This is this is displaced newspapers, displaced magazines. It's not yet displaced us, but uh, you know, we, we, who knows what tomorrow brings? So this is not so easily derailed, correct? It, it's not. And it's still trading at 25 times uh, trailing earnings, which is not cheap. The stock has gone down. We wrote about it a little bit above 170. It's now 155 and change, I believe. Um, but Facebook is tone deaf and it keeps causing problems. Uh, in addition to the Cambridge Analytica stuff, which uh, I'm sure everyone's more than aware of now, Bloomberg had a kind of a magnum opus of an article out today. You know those ads that say you want an iPhone or your computer may be infected that pop up on every website? Oh yeah, they're great. They're great. Well, you wouldn't think that Facebook would support them because a lot of times they're advertising fraudulent products. And in fact, not only was Facebook advertising them, but at this conference they held, Facebook spokespeople held court on stage, introduced speakers and moderated panels. And after this conference, they actually flew with the uh, panel down to Ibiza to party. That was, oh, this was like a fake products conference? Yeah, basically. Um, they, they, they were have, selling- they, they have conferences, fake products people do? Apparently, they, they, they have conferences for people who sell fake mind pills supposedly endorsed by Elon Musk, not really, or fake face cream endorsed by, and I'm not making this up, Chelsea Clinton. And and apparently they have a conference to uh, to network about how best to exploit Facebook. And, and there's a line here, uh, affiliates hijack them. Facebook's targeting algorithm is so powerful, they said, that they don't need to identify suckers anymore. Facebook does it for them automatically. <laughs> But um, F Facebook is tone deaf. It keeps having crisis after crisis. The Europeans are beginning to regulate um, data protection. And now the, one of the few things that unite Republicans and Democrats today is they're angry at Facebook and they want some kind of data protection. And th this uh, is, you know, isn't this blowback against Facebook in good part political? I mean, isn't this an anti-Trump eruption as much as anything else? Is it something more than that? Um, according to uh, data from Axios, which uh, I think Phil also has, the Republicans don't like them very much either. Yeah, this is from today or from last week, actually, when the survey was conducted. But um, Facebook's uh, net favorability uh, rating among um, among the, the, the survey constituents fell by uh, 28 percent. So they had a net positive rating of 33 percent um, in October of 2017, and and uh, as of March, that has dropped to five. That that actually means that uh, Trump is more popular than Facebook at this time. But but there's still analysts are still discounting that Facebook and Google are going to capture half of the entire ad market by uh, 2020. We're still seeing new upstarts uh, that are challenging. Just Amazon's actually becoming a larger advertising presence. People are beginning to allocate more um, advertising dollars to Snap and other competitors. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal the other day about Procter & Gamble and other big advertisers saying th there's kind of a line in this end. These guys have crossed it and they're trying to reallocate their resources accordingly. Okay. Well, as I mentioned, this uh, this episode of Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air is, is brought to you uh, by Grant. And especially, and particularly, it's brought to you by the, it's brought to you by an event that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> How's that for advertising? And that event is going to take place on April 10th at the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan. And it is the uh, the Grand Spring Conference. And uh, it's I, I star studded does not do justice to the, uh, to the lineup. Uh, I will be talking with, uh, well, I'll be listening to Howard Marks, asking him questions. And uh, I don't know, John Burbank is going to be there. John Burbank has got uh, this idea that, um, uh, that uh, great technological change, which might seem to be a familiar story is in fact tomorrow's story and that uh, uh, money uh, itself is going to be uh, transformed. And uh, I don't know, we're going to have, we have, anyway, it's going to be, and uh, it's going to be a fabulous day. Boaz Weinstein, who kind of smoked the London whale, is going to be there talking about uh, credit and talking about opportunities in deeply discounted closed end funds. Uh, John Hathaway, who uh, manages gold stocks for a living, will be talking about what's wrong with gold, what's right with gold. And uh, my favorite single line biographical, autobiographical line is that 
that Kai Stinchcomb wrote for himself. Kai is going to talk about the blockchain. His contention is the blockchain is a technology in search of a use. And Kai describes himself as, quote, whatever the opposite of a futurist is, which I do love. Anyway, uh, so that's that's the Grants Conference on April 10th. And uh, because it's the Grants Conference, we're giving away books. Yeah, yeah, they're free with, of course, uh, your purchase ticket. Let's see, we've got uh, China's Great Wall of Debt by Denny McMahon. That's uh, new. We have Before Babylon, Beyond Bitcoin, From Money That We Understand to Money That Understands Us. That's David Birch. Uh, we have uh, Nassim Taleb's latest, and we have a book called We the Corporations by Adam Winkler. So I, I can't, we have lunch with lunch too, right? Yes, yes. Uh, drinks following. What else we got? Do we got some, perhaps some jazz music? Yeah, we got the uh, we piped in. So anyway, I I um I can't uh, I I well I'm going to insist. We are taking attendance to this event, so please do come. And uh, thank you for listening today. On behalf of uh, Eric and Phil Grant and uh, Evan Lorenz, I'm Jim Jim Grant, and uh, thanks for being with us. And we'll talk to you soon. So long from Grant's Interest Rate Observer. <laughs> <laughs>